Hi, it's Liz Sneddon. I've got a slideshow here to go through talking about the new numeracy unit standards and some ideas and things that I've got. So as a note, this is not ideas from the ministry. This is my personal thoughts and ideas. Okay. So for those of you that don't know me, um, I have a website that does a lot of work with statistics because that's my favorite thing in the world is statistics. Um, and... I grew up in Auckland, um, in Mangere, and I've been to quite a number of schools in the local area and ended up at the Auckland University. Feeling a bit like an outsider at times, being a South Auckland girl, but that's okay. Um, I worked then for a number of years at Auckland University and also at Manukau Institute of Technology before I took some time off and had my kids. And then I trained as a teacher and I've spent quite a few years now teaching at a number of different schools. So here's my beautiful family, um, my husband and my twin girls Jessica and Claire. Um, and that's up in sunny Northland visiting grandparents. So in terms of numeracy, this is what the um, Ministry of Education has said in the standard. So foundation numeracy is the ability to access, use, interpret and communicate maths and stats and faro and ideas. And this was all based around one of the original big changes that they consulted New Zealand about and the big process that they came back with was the need to strengthen the literacy and numeracy requirements across the board. So with that motivation, um, this is where they've, the direction they've taken. So currently, um, a lot of schools do um, three or four standards that students have to pass, and they can get numeracy from other subjects like geography and PE and things like that as well. Um, but typically, most students would do three or four of the math standards and get their numeracy from those. Now, if we think about that in terms of teaching, that means from all of these different silo areas, there are three or four of them that the students cover and then there's a lot of other areas which they don't cover and by limiting what they don't cover we are limiting their future progression at the same time and so what one of the things that they, the ministry is trying to do is to broaden and make sure that everyone gets a more equitable opportunity um, to access future career pathways so from 2023 um, or next year 2020 if you're doing if a school's doing the pilot um, these this little weaving that I've got showing there this is the diagram that talks about what the new numeracy is so it talks about three process ideas formulating approaches to solving problems so that's the key is that we want to do some problem solving the next one talks about using maths and stats to address the demand, numeracy demands. So that's the idea of using procedures accurately. And lastly, we've got explaining the reasonableness of solutions, of responses. And what they're trying to do is weave all of the content throughout all of that. So they can't just show problem solving with numbers um, and explaining reasonableness of solutions and statistics they've got to look at all of these things across all of the content areas so that has some implications for us for teaching and learning in the future so some of the key messages that I personally have pulled out of all the information that the ministry's shared is that NZQA is going to be running it as an external so that means they write the questions and they are marking the questions it's a one-off test um, and that test could either be digital or on paper. Schools get to choose which method it works best for them. They are allowed to have a calculator, so we're not limiting them to being able to do the calculations in the head. Um, and the curriculum level is set to be at low four, um, high four or low five. So that's the idea of where they're at meant to be by year 10. The, one of the key ideas behind it all is that we're meant to assess students when ready. So even though the assessment might be available multiple times during the year, 
as teachers, we need to think about, well, when are our students ready for this assessment and not just sit at once, oh, you failed it, let's try it again, let's try it again. Because we know that that can have quite a demotivating effect and um, have a lot of effect on their confidence and self-esteem. So what we want to do is we want to be able to plan for when are the students likely to be ready and gather some data so that we know when they're ready. The other thing that they are trialling at the moment is that the assessment has it's 60 minutes, but students are allowed longer. So they can take as long as they need, which removes the need for special assessment conditions. Um, and we know not everyone processes at the same speed. Einstein, for example, famous example of somebody who didn't process things fast, but he thought quite deeply about it. So speed is not always what we want to test. We want to test understanding and knowledge. And so that's what they're trying to do is remove that barrier. So thinking about for next year um, and our schools contemplating being part of the pilot um, to give the kids a bit of a head start. So that means that they can get hopefully numeracy in year 10 and then move on into year 11 just looking at the new standards. You could do for some kids it's going to be appropriate to do that numeracy in year 11 as a co-requisite as they originally intend. So it could be done at any stage. Um, we're hoping that most of our year 10s will be ready to do it. So we'll try that next year. So when I was thinking about how would I re redesign a program, there's a number of things that I needed to think about. So I started with looking at, this is a diagram from the Ministry of Education, and it looks at how we weave both the New Zealand curriculum and the school curriculum along with the classroom curriculum into the vision of our values, our principles, our pedagogy, our key competencies and our learning areas. So there's a huge amount of things to think about when we want to try and redesign something. So I'm going to focus on three kind of main areas that I see that affects the maths area personally um, as the curriculum content looking at um, akonga, kaiko and schools and thinking then about the teaching and learning. So I'll start with thinking about the curriculum content and thinking, okay, maths and stats, what is actually being assessed? What, the, what is the knowledge level? And so if I think about what we currently do, we teach things in blocks. So year nine, here we go, geometry, number, algebra, stats, graphs, probability, and measurement and then some end of year exams. Now on each topic they do a test at the end of each topic um, and it's all very very siloed. Same with our year 10s. We've got some geometry, some number, some algebra, some graphs, um, probability stats and then right angle triangles and end of year exam. So we can see this may not be the best fit to help prepare students for the new numeracy because we need to integrate these ideas together of all the strands. So if I think about well what content is actually covered, what is high four, low fives? So for example under number here we want to recognize the degree of precision, choose an appropriate approach, work with numbers into billions, fractions, decimals to 3dp, Percentages, integers, calculating averages, and working with simple interest. So not compound interest, only simple interest. And they gave us a note saying explicitly this is not covered. So multiplying, dividing fractions, exponents, um, reverse percentage problems, compound interest, those are not covered under the number. And then that's the same for each of the other areas. So this is from a document that the ministry said about what there is and isn't going to be covered in it. So that's what my first port of call was to think about, okay, well, this is the stuff that's in there. Um, and then further under measurement, stats and data, thinking about the specific content that is covered. So that's one of the things I need to think about. I need to think, well, in the beginning of year nine, what curriculum level are we getting our students in? And we are getting them in between level three and four plus a few higher level kids, um, but the majority are around about that level. Some schools I've been in um, that I've taught in, we had kids coming in at curriculum level two. Um, so that's my starting point, just to think, where do they come in year nine? Where do I need to get them by the end of year 10? And so by the end of the year 10, 
in order to be ready for the new level one standards in the following year, I need them to, because level one is going to be curriculum level six, so I want them to be at high level five by the end of year 10. So then thinking about where would a good place be to assess numeracy, personally, I'm going to recommend leaving it till year 10, unless you've got an extension class that are a year ahead or something. But for the majority of our kids, I'm thinking mid to late year um, in year 10 would be a good time for majority of them. Remember, I want to assess when ready, so not necessarily all of them will be ready by then. So this is where diagnostics are useful, and I'll assess when ready. And we've got tools um, like ESDO, we've got the PAT tests, um, we've got the PACT um, testing, tracking results. So there's a number of these different things that we have available to us. Our school has used ESDO a bit, um, as well as our own written exams. Um, but as a diagnostic, I'm probably going to say the easiest for me at the moment might just be to use ESDO. And I can just do an assessment across all of the curriculum areas and do a little ESDO test and say, you know, are you at curriculum level 5B? So are you at 5 basic? Because if you're up to that level, then you know what, you're probably ready to give this numeracy test a go. If you're only at level curriculum 4 or lower, that tells me I'm not doing you any favours letting you sit the assessment just yet. Um, so that's one of the things that I want to do is to be able to use that diagnostic throughout their learning to see when are they actually going to be ready. So another factor to think about um, are konga, kayako and schools. So we've been getting a lot of information over the last few years about streaming versus mixed ability classrooms. And my personal preference is mixed ability classes and I've, I've taught in both streamed and mixed ability classes and I'm a strong supporter of mixed ability. Um, here's a few things that have come through is that streaming, what we do is we either cherry pick out the kids at the top end or pick the ones at the, down the bottom and we exclude them. So we exclude students at the top or the bottom because we are not giving them the opportunity to work with others and have that same high expectations. Now based around that, there's some research that talks about how on about 75% of students are actually placed in the correct band, not even the correct class level, but the correct band. So if you have your high, low and um, high, medium and low bands, only 75% of kids would be placed in the right band. So that tells us that our, our testing is not foolproof by any means. It's a very broad brush stroke. And what we want to be doing is we want to be doing inclusive work. That's the whole universal design for learning and a lot of the other philosophies that um, the ministry have explored with the research is about trying to make it more inclusive. So that means looking at some of the research and I know a number of our kairahi have put information out to um, members over time about some of the research. Um, there's a good starting point is um, the Education Hub. I don't know if any of you have been there before, but there's an article there that talks about, it summarises what um, impact of streaming and stuff is on students. So that would be my recommendation is explore some of the research, find out, ask some questions, and then look at in your school what would be sensible. So our school at the currently um, it does stream and we are moving to a mixed ability classroom. So that's been a number of conversations we've had in the, with teachers um, where everyone's got to raise their opinions and, and voice their ideas so that we can collectively understand why this is a good thing. Um, but that's definitely the direction that I'm going in and it's the direction that the ministry is very, very supportive of because that's what the research support says. So another thought um, is about equality and equity. So one of the things that is a big focus for the new any of the new standards is Motaranga Māori um, and the idea that we have bicultural foundations. We might have a multicultural society, but our foundations are bicultural and we haven't respected that and supported that in the ways that they should and need to be. 
And so we've got the kahikatea strategies, we've got the tapasa strategies, um, with information out there about our, our rainbow community. And it all comes to this idea of what is equality versus what is equity. Um, and this is the screenshot that I've got there is um, something that I've taken from the net, um, the internet, and has been around for a while. And it's what we need to do is at the moment, we know some people get an advantage. Okay, I'm white. I get an advantage by being white. What I need to do as a teacher is find ways to ensure that everybody in my class is having equity, not necessarily equality, but equity. And that's the pathway that I need to move forward. So that's thinking about who do I need to prioritize and our NAGs um, and the ministry give us that clear indication of where that support needs to be. And then it's now thinking about how do I do that in a respectful way. So the other factor is to take into account kayako. There, it might be a small group of kayako, could be a large group. We need to think about that. We've got to think about how much experience have we got in the department? How much innovation and ideas have we got with new age stuff? How can we utilize that all in better ways to redesign? So what, what challenges might we face depending on if we've only got two teachers in a department, that means the workload for creating a new program is a lot greater and you might need a longer time frame to develop it. Whereas when you've got a larger department, um, then it might be that you can move through some of these things faster because there is more support from more people. So in terms also school and community, um, there's a difference between schools in terms of that project-based learning philosophy. There's a number of schools that have moved to that and I've worked at some schools that have done that. Um, through to our more traditional one where we do learning in a very sequential way. In some parts of maths, not all parts, some parts of maths learning is sequential. Um, but it is also harder to engage students. So the project-based learning gets more engagement but can sometimes miss areas of the curriculum. Um, and so there's a, belt, there's a continuum between people's beliefs in these different systems and the schools and the community's um, support. Equally, there's a difference between open plan learning spaces versus the traditional classroom. And so these are all things that limit what we can and can't do. Or actually, I'm going to challenge you and say, actually, do they limit? So for example, I've worked in a number of schools with open plan learning and I've worked in schools in traditional classrooms and I can still be that innovative teacher that does flip learning and all these other things regardless of the environment that I work in. So the environment doesn't have to limit what we do. There are times when it does and I acknowledge that but it doesn't have to limit. We're not going to use that as an excuse to limit ourselves. And more importantly, limit what's possible for our akonga. So teaching and learning. Um, one of the things I like about this picture is it shows that idea of ako, that it's teaching and learning comes from both ends, that both of us are involved in the process of kayako and akonga, and we are sharing knowledge between us. So over the last 10 years or so as a teacher, I've explored lots of ideas in terms of research stuff there's been a whole ish, um, process around um, haora and looking at students well-being and that's quite a thing at the moment particularly with COVID um, I've explored using Desmos teacher Desmos student Desmos there's some great stuff going on there um, Insight has got some wonderful new graphs and I really encourage you to go and have a look at that and NZ Grapher is an amazing product and so I've explored a lot about developing my teaching and ideas and how I teach in the classroom with some of these different technology tools. We've looked into some um, neuroscience ideas, um, that cognitive learning, um, all of those kind of things. I've looked into flip learning, into blended learning, and of course our SAMA, which is our technology-based integration um, model. So there's been a lot of stuff. For me to take all of this into account, plus all of those other things that I've just talked about, and I've got to try and somehow pull that all together 
to come up with a new program redesign that's not going to cause me to be completely overworked. Um, oh, and of course our key competencies. I nearly forgot those, sorry. Um, they're quite an important one as well. So differentiation, in order to make mixed ability classes work, whether I do flip learning, whether I do traditional talk and talk, all of these things come back to I can differentiate. And universal design for learning is something that through the ministry stuff we've, I've just been doing, that is um, an area of research and ideas that is going to help me be able to differentiate more in my classroom, to think about how do I improve access, how do I make it more inclusive, um, not just in the type of assessments that I do, but in terms of the teaching that I do. So not necessarily holding all the information on and only releasing it in dribs and drabs, but sharing that with the students in different formats. How they choose to access it is up to them. The information is there, it needs to be learned, and I'm going to support the learning of it, but I'm going to offer choices along the way. So here's a little bit of a snapshot of um, what the UDL is that I've kind of explored a little bit through the ministry. Um, it talks about these three areas, so engagement, representation, and action and expression. And it's all about having multiple means of doing that. So multi giving kids choice, minimizing distractions. It's all our classroom management type stuff. We've got to look at ways to represent it so I can give the students a visual. I can give them a video. I can give them a workbook, pen and paper. Having multiple representations is an important choice for students to have. Um, te text to um, Speech to text options um, on our computers, for example, has opened a lot more doors for many, many people. Um, and then looking at how students demonstrate their understanding and knowledge is going to be something that I need to do more of. So another factor that I'm thinking about is this whole cognitive load and thinking about, well, I know we've got students got to process this information, they've got to store it in their short term memory, and then we've got to make it stick into their long term memory. So as I'm thinking about how do I teach all of this content without teaching it in silos, there is still some foundational stuff that I've got to make sure kids are getting that repetition of in order to be able to make that stick into their long term memories, that they don't just retain that information for 20 seconds, um, but they retain that over a longer period of time. So that's part of what I'm going to think about in the redesign too. And here's a little bit more information about the cognitive load theory. And it's that idea that your brain can only store a certain amount in the working memory. So in one lesson on one day, I can't just teach an entire topic in one go. It's too much information for students to process. I have to spread it out um, over a period of time because there's a limited amount of memory available. Long-term memory, it's a, there's, that's unlimited, but short-term memory, there's a limited amount of space, if you like, to store stuff. So I need to now put all of that together. And there's so many more things I haven't talked about that I'm sure you guys have explored and, and think needs to be included in your programs. Those are just some of the thoughts that came to my mind as I'm thinking about how do I redesign. So I'm again going back to where do my kids start? Where do I want them to get to? When am I going to do my numeracy? And that has helped me come up with an idea. Um, so some of the main themes that I've seen in the level one standards are things like problem solving. We need kids to problem solve and that covers a number of different strands. I've seen that there's stats investigations. So again, collecting those investigation types together and thinking about data holistically rather than silo. So then our reasoning, those ideas of reasoning with numbers, reasoning with algebra, geometry, measurement, etc. That idea of reasoning is coming through. And then we've got the literacy. So that's my year nine goals. I'm thinking I want them at curriculum level four plus by the end of year nine. So yes, some are going to come in at level two or three. By the end of year nine, I'd like them at least at level four, hopefully further, but at level four, solid level four. So 
I'm, we're going to have mixed ability classes. I'm going to use the ES or testing to identify where the gaps are so I can better tailor courses for individual students um, and making them take that ownership and understanding themselves. So when we get ES results that each of them look at where their gaps are and go, I need to do more work on this and this, but these are the topics I'm pretty good with. And of course, I have to do more, including Mataranga Māori. I don't necessarily fully understand what it all is, um, but I've got a few ideas to get myself started with, and I'm going to be looking for PD opportunities that come up every now and again with people sharing some Mataranga Māori ideas, and I'm going to absorb as much as I can to pass that on to my teaching programs. So this is what I'm thinking for year nine, is that we start with term one and two, a whole pile of problem solving type focus. So I've got to teach skills first, that's my cognitive load type stuff. Do the skills and it's got to cover all of those different areas because they've got to learn problem solving that could involve number and measurement in a problem. Then once they've got their skills, then I can move on to doing some actual problem solving. So start with some small problem solving questions, moving on to the larger ones. So that's my thoughts at the moment. And then in term three, move into a stats and probability investigation focus. So again, skills first. So covering summaries, comparison, time series, experimental and theoretical probability. Now I haven't got by varied in there. And the reason for that is in the numeracy standard, it doesn't have that by varied in there. So I'm going to cover that again later in year 10, but for year 9, I'm going to leave it out. So once I've done the skills and help students learn the skills that they need, you know, drawing the graphs, calculations, um, understanding the features, all of that, then I'm going to go on and actually do full investigations and, and get the kids embedded in investigations. So in term 4, let's jump in and do some reasoning. And again, skills first, number, algebra, graphs, measurement, geometry. And then moving into solving and investigating problems. So that's what I'm looking at doing, is that idea of um, focusing around combining the strands together, reconnecting the learning, but skills first, and then onto the bigger problems type thing. So then in year 10, once they're at... If I know they can get most of them up to level 4 plus by the end of year 9, then I've got another year to get them to level 5 plus by the end of the year. So that means they'll be at curriculum, they'll be ready for curriculum 6 in year 11. So the idea is to have the numeracy in the first half year, spend half a year really focusing on that. And then um, combine that with our mixability classes, our ES or testing um, to identify are they ready? I'm not going to assess them till they're ready and embedding our Mataranga Māori into our course. So term one and two would be a purely numeracy based focus. And again, I'm going to do the skills first. So in year nine, we've done curriculum level up to curriculum level four plus, but we've just covered all the skills in year nine. So in year 10, now we've got to do up to the curriculum level low fives. So skills, do some problem solving, and then do some maths and stats literacy. And the reason I do this, the maths and stats literacy a little bit later is often that literacy needs the knowledge first. You need to know what a straight line is and what a gradient is before you can interpret what that is in another situation. Um, so, so that's where I would do the maths and stats literacy last, personally. So that means that they would... Most of them will be ready, hopefully, um, to sit the numeracy assessment at the end of term two. Some of them may not be, so some of them may need a little bit more time in year 10 to do that. But I'm going to use some ES or testing or other things to determine if they're ready. So then term three and four switch to more of a reasoning focus. So looking into, again, those skills first, and this is now upgrading curriculum level five skills and doing our solving investigating. So that would be my one thought. 
Now that may or may not work depending on what other teachers and what other schools and anything else work. So it could be, for example, that I say, actually, it's a lot to take in to try and redevelop this. How about I just start with year 10? I leave my year 9 program alone, leave it as it is, and I just focus on the year 10 program. And I do that half year of numeracy at the start, and then I do more some, some reasoning and some statistics at the end of the year. Um, so that could be another option. Then I need to think about, well, what if a student sits the numeracy test but then doesn't, or sits it but doesn't pass it? So those students would need to have some more time in Term 3 preparing for it. And it might be that they need Term 3 and also Term 4 to prepare for it. <clears throat> or it might be that they're not going to be ready until they're in Year 11. So I need to find ways to identify those students and support them. <clears throat> Keep them in a mixed ability classroom would be still the goal, but I'm differentiating the learning so that they might be covering, going over and reminding themselves of the curriculum level four and five skills, whereas at low five, whereas some of the other students may be more pushing towards the high level five skills. So that's also when I would think about, well, those students that don't get their numeracy, do I put them into a numeracy class in year 11? And I do not want to deny them the opportunities. And so then I would look at having a year 11 program for them, which includes numeracy and the unit standards. And it could be that, I, that some kids might only do two internals, but some kids might be ready to do both internals and both externals, and as well as numeracy in that year. So I, I want to think about how I can have a course and the right teacher to get those students and keep those doors open for them if they are ready for it, keep the doors open, support them and help them get to where they need to go. So that's kind of one thought of thinking. Another one would be in terms of that thematic or project based learning. So with the focus that the new standards have got on investigations and problem solving, this might be a good time for me to think about is that where my school is at? Is that where the department is at? Are we looking at exploring these ideas or have we been exploring these ideas already? And so this could play, these new standards could play very well to that style. And my challenge would be to go back to the curriculum um, and look at the details of exactly what's covered and just make sure that when students are doing any project-based learning, have they covered all of those areas that they need to? Because our new standards are covering all of the curriculum, they're not just allowing us to focus on one or two areas anymore. They have we have to get that thematic, or we have to get that um, across the board approach. So there's a few ideas from me. Um, hopefully you guys find this useful and interesting, and it can start some conversations for you all about what works for you, for your kayako, for your akonga for your school, your community, um, and, and then you can find the way forward because my pathway forward may not be the right thing for you your, and vice versa, but hopefully some of these ideas will help you figure out what your pathway might be.